Principles of Microeconomics, Chapter 18, Public Economy, Professor Wagner. Voter Participation, Cost of Elections, Special Interest Politics, Flaws in a Democratic System of Government from an Economic Standpoint, outlined in this chapter. Domestic Tires. While these tires may all look similar, some are made in the states, some aren't. Those that are not could be subject to a tariff that could cost all tires to be higher. So this is an issue of public economics and the influence of. Can democratic governments enact sensible economic policies? Well, certainly they can. Uh, Democratic governments react to voters and not just to analysis of supply and demand curves. It's actually the constituency that somehow needs to be placated in the uh, dynamics of this particular issue. Institute politics plays a role in allocating the resources. Economists have played an active role along with other social science scientists in analyzing how much uh, such political institutions work, and usually it's just simply one ideology path versus another in the case of Democrats and Republicans in the United States. So just, you know, so just as markets face issues and problems that lead to undesirable uh, outcomes, uh, Democratic governments can also mistakes by either enacting policies that do not benefit society as a whole and failing to enact policies that would have benefited the society as a whole. And once again, it's not that we have a complete lack of sensible, uh, sharp analytic minds available to administer policy, but rather a self and special interest seems to continuously inhibit you know policies that are actually good for society a couple of examples um, I will go ahead and point to the ACA or the Affordable Care Act which uh, was almost an oxymoron it was never affordable and is it less so now and hardly anyone could care about it uh, the other uh, the other uh, thing is the current uh, tax cuts enacted by President Trump who are supposed to positively impact uh, the middle class, but it completely was lacking in thought about special situations like uh, families who are caregivers to you know caregivers to older parents or uh, families who have multiples of children, let's we'll say more, two or three in the household. Uh, the old tax law certainly benefited these groups much more than the uh, current new one. So I'm not, you know, even if I'm not exactly a part of that so-called middle class and it hasn't negatively impacted me, I can say for a lot of my colleagues in the education business that not everybody's in my situation and they simply got back a great deal less in terms of a tax refund than from the years before. So it's questionable about who they were really trying to help. And that these exemplify this point. Voter participation and the cost of elections. So in other countries, they tend to vote more than people in the US. Uh, some countries have pretty much laws that will require voting. So you have, you know, Germany, Spain, and France, where you have most people casting ballots. Australia, Belgium, Italy, Turkey, and a number of others have laws that require everyone vote. Uh, but in the U.S., we're only talking about 55 to 65 percent of the voting age citizens actually voted. And then, uh, in, con in congressional districts where there was no presidential race, turnout's often less than half the eligible voters. So there's certainly a case of greater voter apathy inside the United States for whatever reason. Probably my, I would surmise that there is a fairly substantial group of group of people who feel unrepresented by either party. 
So voter participation and reasons for it. Okay, no law can require that each voter cast an informed or thoughtful vote. And so why do you think people choose not to vote? Well, rational ignorance, people will not vote if the cost of becoming informed and voting are too high or they feel like their vote will not make an impact. Uh, I hear that one most often with many people I speak with on a, you know, impromptu basis. And uh, I kind of disagree with that. Whether you think the system's perfect or imperfect, it doesn't really matter. If you, if you don't vote, then you shouldn't complain about the results afterwards. It is a participatory government, but that's a personal feeling and not necessarily anything uh, that could be mandated or should be. And then I would say the reason that people choose not to vote is just apathy. And the rational ignorance thing definitely comes into play with about 85% of the people that just don't even know what they're voting for or why. Or they have some outdated notion of the ideology of the party that they're with, you know, thinking that, you know, I've always done it this way and I'm going to continue to do it th with this way, regardless of any shifts in terms of ideologies or platforms by the party. Voting behavior uh, tends to be, elicit more voters that are a little bit more subtle, more connected to society, and tend to vote more frequently, meaning that people whose uh, circumstances are somewhat stable, uh, they're not transient you know, as a result of their employment, picture jobs, or family, and they tend to stay in the same place. They'll, they'll connect with what's actually going on locally, so they'll turn out more. But, uh, you know, politicians elected by 60% or fewer of the population may not, uh, you know, enact an economic policy in the best interest of 100% of the population. Well, it goes back to first thing, don't vote, don't complain, right? U.S. spending on campaigns. Uh, how much uh, spending on campaign is too much? And so they give you some figures. And you can talk about, you know, different ways to... Uh, quantify or qualify the amount of money spent for, for a vote. And really, I think it is far too much. It, there is definitely the perception, ongoing perception, that elections could be bought to some largesse. Uh, the current president actually underspent his uh, competitor, Hillary Clinton, by a large margin. So just because you spend more doesn't mean you're going to get more. And the recent uh, primary run of uh, Bloomberg certainly amplified that point to the highest when you blow a billion dollars and you're not even, you know, remotely in consideration. You have to wonder what the real ploy is. And so it is a tricky business, tough to define for the average person on the street. And so perhaps that's the reason people disconnect. Special interest politics is basically people who want to exert a disproportionate effect on political outcomes, while pressure to, you know, legislators enact public policies do not benefit society as a whole, but rather, you know, cater to their interest, hence special interest groups. They are large, you know, largely somewhat self-motivated and uh, selfishly motivated, and uh, and the cost are generally borne by a large number who remain anonymous or what they like to use deem as the silent majority. Uh, if it's really the case that we have a silent majority in a participatory government system where most people are not participating, I mean, how could you how can you say that this is not working when no, when people just simply check out? Uh, once again, I think people need to participate more. This is just a personal opinion, and it's not relevant to the class, but I think everybody does have an opinion about it. And uh, you have to consider, you know, why would you vote or why wouldn't you vote? And that's really the question. So special interest politics will say a tariff on tires imported from China would increase the price. Um, this is tariffs 
embargoes and other such uh, economic measures used in concert against another country because of poor or non-existent trade policies is a tool in the tool bag. And to some level, the consumer may have to bear the cost of the so-called trade war. And so it's a question of, okay, do we you know, want to bring the jobs back here or do we want to continue to let the corporations uh, go ahead and increase their margins by using cheap or free labor that pretty much exists within, we'll say, China and other super underdeveloped countries in terms of you know, wages and resources. Um, that's you know what people have to decide. And the recent COVID crisis has made, hopefully, everyone reconsider and rethink just what all that's about. And uh, certainly things that are essential to the national infrastructure, healthcare would be such a cornerstone. Uh, we need to have a lot more control over what's going on with our, you know, our, our medical supply and uh, and pharmaceutical supply, and so that should not be outsourced uh, at a 99% you know centile to let's say another country like China, who can decide to just simply hold back and not give us what I what what they need you know, what we need as a political gesture because they. You know, we did something they didn't like. So if you want to be less beholden to the people, you have to bring things closer to home. Also, there's the argument, and I'll discuss this here, is that how if you have an eroding middle class, if you have fewer people that are making, you know, making more money, but rather a growing population and make less than the generation before, you have to ask yourself, who are the customers that are going to buy my premium product as a company? And the fact of the matter is, in the quest for higher profits, we've eroded our own customer base internally here in the United States. And so companies will somehow inadvertently uh, shrink their business, you know, shrink or maybe even dissolute their uh, business altogether as a result of the greed policy. So. There are a lot of arguments that can go back and forth here, and I find it interesting to talk about, but uh, that's really not the subject. But, you know, just remember that tariffs, embargoes, uh, they are, you know, tools used by governments to try to enact or balance trade policies. Special interest in lobbyists, um, this is unfortunately uh, too much of a uh, part of the political framework in the United States. And so, you know, people go into office and either the House or the Senate, they hang out for a while, they get out, they know all the ins and outs of the political cycle, and they go to work as a consultant for some, you know, industry, you know, you know some industry giant that wants to have influence in Washington. So it really is some I would consider it corrupt and I feel like that there really should be a, an elimination of this form of uh, influence and so it does not represent the people as a whole but the people as a whole have to speak up and try to make changes because they're not going to do it on their own if it's business as usual this is what you have but this is the dynamic that people are looking at why legislation that people don't really feel like that benefits them. That's how it comes to be because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. The people that are talking the most get heard while the people who aren't saying anything at all, uh, nobody knows what, what they're thinking. Port barrel spending. And so that's one of those things that, you know, are geared toward uh, a single political district. Uh, Senator, you know, Senator Wright uh, here in Fort Worth, or Congressman Wright, I should say, had tremendous influence in terms of uh, the industrial military complex. He had uh, actually supported uh, the influx of a number of defense contractors. We have a very large military industrial footprint here in Texas. We've been a 
benefited from uh, for decades, still exists long since his departure, and um, is kind of a by you know, it's a benefit for our area. So that would be an example of pork barrel log rolling is an action where all members of a group vote on a package of otherwise unrelated laws that they favor. So basically, they th this is the stuff that they, the ad hoc stuff they throw into a bill that's absolutely great and people need, but they're going to throw in a bunch of nonsense that isn't related, such as spending for the Kennedy Center when everybody's desperately needing money and food because there's a, you know, 22 million people freshly unemployed. So that would be log rolling. Pork barrel spending is another case where concentrated benefits uh, widely dispersed costs challenge democracy. The benefits are obvious and direct to local voters, while the costs are spread over the entire country. Certainly, this has uh, been a consistent uh, behavior that's, you know, graded, you know, the overall population for decades. People constantly complain about it. And really, I think they need to reconsider who they put in office, you know, as a result of that type of policy. Quantifying pork barrel spending so the, we can actually, uh, you know, put numbers on it. And these are numbers that we have here below for 14, 15, and 16. And what on the earmark is, is basically additional little uh, sections of the bill that are unrelated to the main uh, point of the bill where okay well if you want this and you got to give me these little things here and so that's part of the negotiation process the process that goes on and so there have been calls to basically eliminate earmarks and legislation I'm for that uh, many people are but is still a common practice. Many times, uh, democracy is simplified as majority rule. That's not entirely the case in our system, and probably justly so, because if it's about population concentration, what you'll find is the great, the, the very large urban concentrations, and their uh, voting preferences and ideological preferences will permeate everybody else where those preferences neither fit or apply. So what goes on in Los Angeles or New York City uh, certainly is not relevant to what happens in Iowa. And you know, how can you expect people that are disconnected with those large populous regions to be beholden to concepts or ideologies that are just a total mismatch for what the population wants in that area. So that's been handled in the constitutional framework. Uh, medium voter theory is politicians try to match policies or uh, pleases the medium voter preferences. So there's always a discussion about whether you, you know, a party goes to the right or to the left to get some kind of uh, what you call a fervent voter base. But somehow, you know, they always, always a discussion of coming back to the middle, meaning that we want to capture a much larger cross section of the voting pop, you know, public. Voting cycles, that's you know, a situation where majority prefers A over B, B over C, or C over A. And so it's just simply, and that is more in line with what goes on in the primary. Ultimately, our choice is binary for presidential elections after each uh, party gets their candidate put forward. And then so you have a voting cycle and voting will struggle to produce a majority outcome. And you can see this thing is being quite circular. So but given these preferences in the end, lasagna is favored over Turkey by a two to one margin. Uh, so once again, you know, it's very cyclical, circular, and very cyclical at that. Correcting mechanism. Unlike firms, government agencies do not sell their products in a the market. They're not challenged by competitors. Uh, if government agencies are poor, performing for, uh, poorly, 
uh, citizens can't get it from another provider but drive existing agencies into bankruptcy. The, press, the pressure government faces to change its bureaucracy seeks greater efficiency and to promote, you know, improve customer responsiveness is much milder than the threat of being put out of business. So you're kind of stuck with it is what they're trying to say here. Government competing with firms, and that happens every now and then. The U.S. Postal Service is probably one of the better examples. It's government, but not government. And uh, somehow it has some preferential treatment. And the hue of the government, you know, being under the uh, government umbrella, whereas uh, DHL, UPS, and FedEx do not. And so, but just the same, they are competing with the U.S. Postal Service. And the advent of Amazon uh, certainly has revitalized the U.S. Postal Service, which actually was running itself into dirt in terms of its financial ability to stay viable. So th that's a very interesting dynamic. I think that proves to be a very good example. A balanced view of markets and government. There are three ideas and how they interrelate. Markets are extraordinarily useful, flexible institutions, which society can allocate its scarce resources. Uh, markets may un uh, produce unwanted results. Government may play a useful role in trying to mediate this. Uh, the result is there's no simple or obvious political conclusion, and I think that's quite visible. End of chapter 18.